Hi everyone, thank you for joining us on TNT today and uh, wow, what a day yesterday. Apart from getting the program demonetized, uh, I got a, an awful lot of comments, most of them negative comments, about the coverage of some sex trafficking allegations against a bar in uh, I think Soy 6 in Patia, uh, including two emails which included death threats. Uh, I've had to delete quite a few of the comments which uh, not because they were negative towards the program or me, but because they were inciting violence and making some uh, just ridiculous claims. So uh, with a certain amount of trepidation, we're going to be covering the issue of uh, the legalization of Thailand's sex industry today, see how YouTube treats that particular story. But uh, to those people that didn't like me reading out that story, you've got to understand that I'm quoting uh, published stories. I tell you who the publishers are. They're not words coming from me. Uh, and they're given in the spirit of just trying to pass on information and news. You can decide whether you want to believe it or not. But don't take it out on me when you disagree with some of the stories that I'm reading. I wasn't expressing any personal opinions. So uh, we'll just backtrack a little bit on a few stories from a few days ago, and we'll start with this one uh, from the Straits Times. China warns Taiwan independence and peace are mutually exclusive as military drills conclude. So this concludes about three days of drills that the Chinese have been doing ever since that visit between the, uh, well, the, the meeting between the Taiwanese president and the US House Speaker. That happened last week and got uh, Beijing politicians in a bit of a knot. And the Straits Times story says that peace in the Taiwan Strait and independence for Taiwan are mutually exclusive, according to the Chinese. And it followed three days of war games. Taiwan independence and Taiwan Strait peace and stability are mutually exclusive things. This according to the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson. If we want to protect peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, that's the area between the island of Taiwan and mainland China, we must firmly oppose any form of Taiwan independence separatism. And China ended its military drills around Taiwan on Monday, saying it had tested integrated military capabilities under actual combat conditions, having practiced precision strikes and also blockading the island Beijing views as its own. So that's a bit of a conclusion, I suppose, to three days of what we usually describe as saber-rattling when it comes to Taiwan and China. And just by means of background, Chinese announced the three days of drills last Saturday after the Taiwanese president returned to Taipei following a meeting in Los Angeles with the U.S. House Speaker of Representatives. Heading now to a much more local story and the almost unsolvable problem, at least in the short term, of the high amount of air pollution in northern Thailand and the decimation of the northern Thailand tourism industry. Now, let's just uh, go to this story from Thai PBS World. And Chiang Mai Civic Groups are filing an action against the PM, NEB and NEC. What are all those things? Well, they're filing a suit against the Prime Minister, Prayut chan who's, of course, now acting in caretaker mode as we lead up to the election, the National Environment Board and the Securities Exchange Commission for their alleged failure to enforce the laws to tackle PM 2.5 pollution, which has been threatening the livelihoods and health of the people in the northern provinces. And a director of the Centre for the Protection and Revival of Local Community Rights says that Section 9 of the Enhancement and Conservation of the National Environment Quality Act gives full power to the Prime Minister to solve environmental problems, but he's never invoked this law. A lot of people have been criticising the government for doing nothing. I mean, I'm not really sure what they can do. Clearly asking the Chinese temples to stop burning the joss sticks and firing those jets of water in the air, that's just pissing in the wind. But the big things, uh, it looks like they have started to do, like contact the uh, prime ministers or the leaders of the countries around us. But again, that's going to rely on them doing something, and they're not just short-term measures that are going to be fixing the problem today. 
Now, an oncologist specialist at the Faculty of Medicines of Chiang Mai University says the people in Chiang Mai have been living with PM2.5 dust levels of over 50 microns for a long time and are at a risk of suffering from epidermal growth factor receptor. That doesn't sound good. Positive lung cancer, heart diseases and strokes. Well, of course, that's all bad enough for the individuals, but the amount of damage to the tourism industry, which we'll check out with some of the international coverage in a moment, is also going to affect the hip pockets of people working in tourism in the area. And the group uh, who filed their complaint with the provincial authorities, they read a statement about air pollution in northern provinces and the health impacts it has, which they claim have affected more than 2 million people this year. And it seems that a lot of the hospitals are just full at the moment with people with respiratory problems. Let's go to some of the international coverage about this because the problem is making headlines around the world now. We start with the Straits Times and pollution choking northern Thailand hits tourism in Chiang Mai worries the public. And the Straits Times reports that high pollution levels in Thailand's northern city of Chiang Mai and surrounding provinces are keeping tourists away and alarming locals, with the government yesterday urging residents to avoid outdoor activity. Well, I suppose it means that they're trying to do something, but uh, avoiding outdoor activities is really the antithesis of why a lot of tourists go to Chiang Mai in the first place. Chiang Mai, known for its scenic mountain views, temples and chic cafes, received nearly 11 million visitors in pre-pandemic 2019, but hotel bookings in the city have dropped to 45% occupancy, according to the Thai Hotel Association Northern Chapter. And that's far short, they say, of the 80-90% to occupancy expected ahead of this week's Thai New Year holidays, known as Songkran. Of course, Songkran is really big in Chiang Mai. And uh, it's probably the biggest party they have there for the whole year. And they usually expect uh, the place to be pretty much booked out at this time of the year. A 53-year-old who sells orange juice says, It's impacted my business. People aren't coming. They can't see the view. And, well, if you go to Chiang Mai, of course, you want to see the view. Addressing the deteriorating air quality in the North Thailand's health ministry urged the public yesterday to avoid outdoor activities and wear masks that can filter particles. Well, really, just a a Band-Aid suggestion and no help at all, I'm sure, to the people up there in northern Thailand. Let's see what it's like today from IQ Air. And we're glad to report that Chiang Mai at least is down to number four in the world today of the cities listed by IQ Air. And we can see there that the air pollution is still very high up there in northern Thailand. I've underlined Chiang Rai up in the north and Chiang Mai a bit further down. And you've got Myanmar to the left, Laos, where a lot of these fires are, is uh, probably the worst affected. And they don't appear to have many monitoring stations. So they would certainly be even worse than northern Thailand as you can see there from uh, the the colour red, which denotes where the worst air pollution is. So that's the current situation on IQ Air. Let's look at some other international coverage. And the South China Morning Post says that smog drives away Thailand tourists as Laos Myanmar farmers grow cash crops for China. So they're taking a slightly different angle on this story. More than 2 million people in Thailand have been hospitalised with breathing problems this year as farmers in Myanmar and Laos slash and burn land. Regulating agriculture is challenging as it affects people's livelihoods, while the crisis in Myanmar makes border management virtually impossible. And that's why this is almost an unsolvable problem for the current Prime Minister, but I'm sure he is going to suffer at the polls as a result. And that story says the pollution has stubbornly stayed, but the tourists have not, with bookings for what was Thailand's second most visited city before the pandemic having fallen off a cliff. The owner of a boutique hotel in the northern city says the smog is everywhere. Customers have been calling to cancel their stays. It gets worse each year. We go to a CNN World story. Smoke from forest fires blankets, northern Thailand in thick pollution. 
and smoke from fires in northern Thailand is making it hard to breathe and at least one hospital in Chiang Mai says it's reached full ward capacity as people present with respiratory issues from breathing air pollution. And the second paragraph, air pollution has been a long-standing problem in Thailand, usually caused by heavy road traffic in the case of the capital Bangkok. Well, I mean, Bangkok, like uh, any large Asian city, has got problems with uh, sort of city air pollution. But it is tiny in comparison with the amount of pollution being caused by these forest and agricultural fires. If it was a problem, then we'd have Bangkok up uh, on the top of the list of the worst air polluted cities in the world every day. But that's not the case. But this year, third paragraph, pollution levels spiked across the country as a result of forest fires and widespread crop burning during the annual slash and burn farming season between December to April. And a local cafe owner says the air has become increasingly polluted and dangerous to breathe, strong and smelly. He says uh, it's already April, but the situation has gotten worse. There's no improvement. A lot of people have fallen so sick. It's scary to think of breathing in air that will kill you. And that story covered by CNN World. And this from Voice of America. Thailand's air quality could cloud the Songkran Festival. In the second paragraph there, in the northern city of Chiang Mai, a thick haze of air pollution has been present in recent weeks and experts are warning that conditions are likely to hamper tourism around the upcoming national holiday. The story goes on, although the practice is illegal, farmers continue to do it as the few alternatives are more costly. And they say the uh, haze pollution has soared in recent years. As home to Thailand's largest and often longest Songkran celebrations, Chiang Mai's tourism sector is especially vulnerable. I would probably argue that the celebrations they hold in Pattaya each year are bigger and longer now, but I appreciate that Chiang Mai has got a long tradition in hosting a, a big Songkran festival. Maybe not so much this year. This is the TNT program Tuesday. Thank you very much for watching. And if you get an opportunity, please subscribe to the channel. Now, the next story from VOA. Let's see how we go with this. And Thailand drafts a bill to decriminalize its billion dollar sex industry. Again, uh, this is Voice of America a public broadcaster in the USA. They're reporting from the rows of massage parlors, pulsing nightclubs and rowdy bars of Thailand's gaudy red light districts. The country's billion dollar sex trade operates all but in the open. Technically, the sex they sell is illegal. Now this is nuanced and the story goes a long way to actually describe the legality of the situation. And it calls for repealing the 1996 Prevention and Suppression of Prostitution Act, which makes most sex work a crime, replaces it with a new law. It's going to be called the Protection of Sex Work Act, affirming the rights of sex workers and their places of business to sell sex. And the bill proponents hope it will help the country's sex workers, estimated to be between 100 and 300,000 people, But opponents a bit further down fear it will leave many sex workers exploited by middlemen and trafficking gangs and clash with the country's values and traditions, hence the very nuanced situation, and we'll cover that further in this particular story. And the Director General of the Department of Women's Affairs and Family Development, one of the people who've been working on this bill, says giving sex workers legal status will mean that their rights will not be violated, will not be exploited by their clients or sex business operators and have a better quality of life. And this paragraph, I think, goes a long way to explain some of the subtleties about the current situation while getting paid for sex is not illegal in and of itself in Thailand, soliciting and advertising paid sex is. So is running a business where sex is for sale, putting much of the country's sex industry outside of the law. So obviously a very subtle game played by the customers, by the owners of these businesses, and of course by the sex workers themselves. Repealing the 1996 law would make all that legal, The new law drafted to replace it, though, would require the clubs, bars and parlours where sex is sold to apply for a special licence. 
and this associate professor from Tamasat University says sex workers are afraid of the police because it's illegal. If they inform that they were assaulted by somebody, the police would ask them, where were you assaulted and why did you go there? Which, of course, drags the police into a very difficult situation where the law is not clear at the moment. And a sex worker called Mai says if her work were legal, the bar she works out of would not have to skim her wages to pay the bribes so local authorities will turn a blind eye. She said she could also get the bar to fix her wages as a guaranteed rate that would not rise or fall at the owner's whims. And this is one of the current problems. The situation is completely deregulated and it's all done with a wink and a nod. With labour laws on the sex worker side, she added, we could get paid fairly and we would be just another worker in other jobs. But the other side of the coin here, this is from a former director of Thailand's non-government centre for the Protection of Children Rights Foundation, says the Thais should have the right to sell their own sex on their own behalf, but he worries that entrenching the system of middlemen who now run much of the industry will also keep sex workers from earning their fair share of the profits. Without stepped-up law enforcement, always a problem in Thailand, he said he worries too that arming bars and clubs with government licences to sell sex could make it easier for sex traffickers who force people into the industry to hide their crimes in the guise of illegal business. And he says instead that the government should be doing more to draw people away from or out of the sex trade rather than formally endorsing an industry he believes is bred by and breeds other social ills. Still, a sex worker rights advocate who runs a group called Service Work In Group, or SWING, says she remained optimistic about change. And it looks like uh, this bill is being prepared And I'm pretty sure it will go uh, to Parliament for a first reading before the end of this year. And I'd just like to briefly thank our sponsors, Five Star Marine. They've got a whole fleet of these great little boats if you want a private premium tour off the island of Phuket to any of the 32 islands. I can highly recommend Five Star Marine. There's a link if you'd be interested in finding out more in the description of this video. Tuesday morning for our TNT. Thank you for your ongoing support as we close in on 20,000 subscribers. And we go to this story now from ASEAN Now. Tourists challenged, break Skywalk, get 500,000 baht. Sounds like a uh, good challenge indeed. Now this is about those Skywalks. Uh, They seem to be popping up everywhere. Uh, This one is up on the Mekong. I think they had a problem sometime in recent weeks where there was a crack in one of the panes of glass. Now they are made mostly from glass people are walking on glass and they can see directly down some people freak out and you have to wear special socks to walk on them now i'm not sure what the engineering problem was with this particular skywalk but they're now trying to get people back and they're saying well if you can break the glass we'll uh, give you 500,000 baht i bet a lot of people will take up that challenge Ties have been challenged to break a pane of bulletproof glass on the mekong skywalk in chang sen Also not a bad way to get people to pay to get on it in the first place. The famous tourist attraction was closed after one of the glass segments was broken by visitors. And there it is from the uh, other top. And as I said, these skywalks are becoming quite popular right around the country. An initial investigation with CCTV showed that someone had jumped on it and something had fallen on it, causing it to shatter. Further investigations are underway and it's meant to withstand 2,950 kilos of sand. And there it is looking out across the Mekong, but oh dear, not a great day with a great view because PM 2.5 smoke. And a sign out the front of the tourist attraction by the installation company says, break it and we'll give you 500,000 baht. So I'm absolutely sure there's going to be quite a few people going up there with the intention of trying to get that 500,000 baht. When they're doing so, I'll absolutely make sure that I'm not on the Skywalk at the time. Nothing to do with Star Wars, by the way. Now, this final story is one of those stories, you know, you don't want to cover, but you sort of have to. Here we go, and uh, covered by the Straits Times, but also covered in just about every media around the world today. The Dalai Lama apologises for asking Boy to suck his tongue. Now, I'm not showing the uh, the actual photo uh, of this 
sucking of the tongue because I just don't think we really need to see it. It's freely available if you want to go and find it uh, on the internet. The story says the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, apologized yesterday after a video which showed him asking a boy to suck his tongue, triggered a backlash on social media. The 87-year-old was seen planting a kiss on the boy's lips as he leaned in to pay his respects. The Buddhist monk is then seen sticking his tongue out as he asked the child to suck it. Can you suck my tongue? He's heard asking the young boy in the video. The video is from an event in Dharamsala City back on February the 28th. And the statement says, and again a statement that really doesn't do enough to apologise, His Holiness wishes to apologise to the boy and his family, as well as his many friends across the world, for the hurt his words, his words, have caused. His Holiness often teases the people he meets in an innocent and playful way, even in public and before cameras. He regrets the incident. And Twitter users slammed the video, calling it disgusting and absolutely sick. After it started trending on Sunday, the Dalai Lama remains the universally recognised face of the movement for Tibetan autonomy, and Beijing accuses him of wanting to split China and has referred to him as a wolf in monk's robes. Well, not so much a wolf in monk's robes, perhaps a poacher in the sanctuary. Sick of these people trying to uphold some sort of high moral ground in religious traditions, not behaving themselves. And with that, thank you very much for watching today. Hopefully you're a bit more up to date with things happening around the world and in Thailand. Uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Click that like button on your way out or perhaps the unlike button and we'll see you tomorrow.